to Pete Alexander, who is uh, a Williams local here, but been flying for 30 plus years and is uh, going to share his experience and all his coaching, all his knowledge and what he's been coached on and what he's collected with a mostly a, a take on the Mendos here, but also all of his worldly experiences. So Pete. Thanks, Ben. Um, hi, I'm Pete uh, Alexander. Uh, the picture you see right now is a flying wave over Mount Cook in uh, New Zealand on the South Island. Um, you'll get a mixture of a little bit of everything. Like I said, all questions are good. Even super simple ones you think they're simple, most likely everybody else has a different opinion. Um, so Ben asked me to talk about my background a little bit for the people who don't know who I am, what I've been up to. I'll talk about the coaches have kind of melded my thinking. Uh, I spent a lot of time dissecting the sky, talking about what I see and why. And there's not, you know, dissecting the sky is not a perfect answer. There's a lot of different answers. So um, normally this is more of an interactive thing, which would be a little bit harder with the setup, but by all means chime in um, as appropriate. I got a bunch of soaring tips and tactics, which kind of also get mixed in with the dissecting the sky part. Uh, some training ideas. Then after all of that, obviously you want to know more stuff. So I have some ideas where you seek more knowledge and questions at the very end and kind of throughout the whole thing. Uh, this is a picture from a couple of years ago. I was in uh, Seminole, Florida. Um, a guy named Ben took it as I was going by him in my 32. So um, for the people who don't know, especially you young people out there, um, this is a Schweitzer 233. This is what I soloed in. I really think Ben and Pablo and Ted should all go fly a 233 for a season. Um, I also taught for a little over five and a half years in Fremont. So I learned to fly in Fremont, um, flying over 45 years, uh, full-time instructor uh, with a little over 1,100 flights a year in the back seat of a 233. So all you ASK21 drivers, um, flown about 29 different uh, locations across the U.S., New Zealand, and Europe, and 49 odd contests of the various flavors. I'm um, so everybody should go find a 33 hasn't flown one and fly one to remind yourself why you're so lucky today. Coaches, um, I've had three people really affected my flying. First was Brian Spreckley. I had a chance to fly with him in the 2012 U.S. Team Camp. He needed somebody to uh, drag him around in a two-place glider. And I had just got my Arcus and I was volunteered. So I drove all the way to Tennessee to fly with him. He totally broke my flying for a while, but it's actually really helped. Um, he's a UK coach. And he's also a, a multi-time um, medal winner at the world level. Um, the other guy, G, I've flown G a handful of times in New Zealand. I've flown in New Zealand about eight, nine times. Um, Again, a UK coach that spends half his time in New Zealand, half his time in the UK following the soaring season and a medal winner at the European and world level. Um, he's a great fun guy. Very close friend, Rick Walters. I uh, grew up flying model gliders with them and we raced together and flew together and he kind of is the one that got me started in this whole racing thing. But all of them kind of everything you hear today kind of has some twist from one of these guys. And since you can't fly with all these guys, I'll do my best to share their knowledge with you. So dissecting the skies, if um, you take, there's three things to take away today. And here's one of them, you know, spend more time looking up and more time looking out. And we'll talk a lot about that in the next little bit. But if you take nothing away, if you take one thing away, spend more time looking outside than looking inside. There's nothing inside that's gonna tell you where the next thermal is or the lift line is. Plus you might hit somebody. Okay, so uh, this photo, uh, Uvalde, during the world's uh, as a official um, sniffer, uh, taking different people in back, different VIPs that decided at different times to throw up. Um, anyway, we'd take off before the grid happened and make sure the lift was good for the launch 130 gliders. So here's the key to dissecting the sky. There's a bazillion of them. Uh, again, look up and look out. Look for the changing fabric of the cloud and that's a changing movement that we'll talk a little bit about. Um, and the clouds are always changing, some ways good and some ways bad. A bunch of examples coming. Which is the wind direction? Super important. 
the wispy bits, we'll talk about wispy bits. The key to wispy bit happiness is to get wispy bits that are moving, not just hanging out. If they're hanging out, they're dead to you. Uh, color changes in the clouds, shadows on the ground can help a lot to tell you the path you should take when you're not sure, especially when the visibility is not good. Where's the sun? Are the cloud tops popping? And you might have a thunderstorm problem or you might not. Haze versus clear, which will show you some examples. Haze domes, um, we'll talk about that too. And then are there any wrinkles? And the wrinkles you're worried about is if you have a front coming or a thunderstorm blow off that might shade things um, or change the weather um, or showers of any kind. We'll show you some of that too. So everybody in the world in this fine um, webinar knows that this is a beautiful sky. I don't think anybody argued with that. And if you had your dream come true, every day you fly would look just like this. This is in Eastern New Mexico on the way home a couple of years ago. Uh, nice flat bottom cues, nice towering. Uh, it did this all the way to the horizon, which you can't see. It was quite the day, but we were in the middle of nowhere. And um, Nick, volunteered to get out and we put my glider together and he had auto tow me, you said. And I told him that wouldn't be a great idea. But anyway, other days are like this. This is in Poland, 2014, in the world. Uh, it's my partner, Gary Itner. Um, and it's sometimes not very clear what to do um, or it's very difficult to decide what to do. You can't see the, the clouds really can't see the bottom. Um, so in doubt, you know, fly as straight as you can to the next best idea you can, and hopefully you don't hit the ground. Um, man, these guys would fly in this weather all the time. It, it wasn't much fun in a few days. Um, but sometimes this is why flying on the West Coast is better than the East Coast. Now, one of the key things to do is fly with your eyes wide open. Right now, I think we'd all agree this is a beautiful cloud. Nice flat bottom, nice towering. That looks great. But if we look to the right a little bit, hey, there's some more cloud. Look to, oops, look to the left, there's even more cloud. We actually slid to the right and then rode that cloud straight down to the big dark spot. And we just kept going at hundred knots, but it also kept us totally connected to the cloud. So again, be very careful that you're just staring straight ahead. You don't see things around you. You also not see the changing of the clouds, the darkness, the edges, um, the wispy bits, which we'll show you more about in a second. Is anybody alive out there? Yes, Pete, we are all here. Okay, so starting with the flying the eyes wide open, this is Hobbs uh, to the right, that little town is La Misa on the right edge of the um, photograph. And we'll kind of start this idea of, of um, uh, what we should look at. So the first question, of course, is which side is the wind? And with how there's a slight tilt to the cloud to the right side of the, the God, I wish I had my thing, the right side of the picture, all alone, it's got a little bit of tilt from left to right. And you can see some more tilt in the distance on the left side. So we know that without looking at anything inside the cockpit, that the winds are blowing from left to right. Um, along with this, we have some cloud shadows to consider. And also we have the, we know the sun's from our left to right. It's on the left side of things, which is great. You really wanna have the sun and the wind together working as, as buddies. And that usually will make your day very good. Um, we wanna look at the changing fabric and you can see in the middle, the big middle cloud, there's a little bit of dangly things down, just a wee bit. and. I don't know if those are the right places to go because we can't see them moving, but that changing of the fabric, that little dangly bit is probably where the better thermals are. And on this case, we also have the shadows, which is if you couldn't look up, you'd probably fly, fly in the upwind sunny edge of the shadows trying to find the best climb. Uh, the best climb was in the, uh, the cloud right underneath the word sun. Um, it was just starting to build and we got back to cloud base and we swung around to our left. Um, but, you know, these are kind of the keys as you're flying under cloud streets. Okay, Shasta. This is Montague, just south of the Cisco Airport. Um, and there's a handful of things I see here. So, of course, we start with the wind. Here's the wind. 
right to left. And you can see that basically of how the, you can't see it because it's a static picture, but you can see the cloud shadows moving slowly left from right to left. Um, can't really see, I don't really see it in the, the clouds at, on the edges at all. Um, and the sun again is in cooperation with the wind. This is a beautiful day. We got shadows all over the place to provide the stepping stones of where we wanted to go. Ooh, shoot, it's all right. And there's a couple, the goal was to get to um, Mount Shasta when I took this picture. But if you look at kind of the middle left of the, by where the mountains are in the shade, um, that was about where the snow started, the snow showers. So realizing that early enough, I was able to slide back to the right into the sun, into the wind, instead of just barely my way through that snow shower and I ended up on top of Shasta. So the, the snow showers, let alone not good for lift, um, it also tends to slow down the, the soaring, if not out, out and out, kill it. Hey Pete. Yeah. We have a comment on more on where it works best under a big wide cloud streak. Okay. Oh, look, we have a big wide cloud streak. <laughs> Oh, by the way, about Shasta, by the way, about Shasta, if you want to fly up there, there might be a little cam. Is there a cameo for a contest in here somewhere? Might get Is there a what? We can go fly that. We can go fly Mount Shasta this year at a contest, right? Yep. There's a contest scheduled for the middle two weeks of June, uh, the 20 meters and the uh, standard class. Um, it'll be amazing. It'll be awesome. Okay, back to John's question. Um, so we have a cloud street and how do you find your best way again? So the first question is, which way is the wind? I'm not gonna respond until somebody responds on chat to say, which way is the wind? Left to right or right to left? Right to left. Wow, out of <clears throat> right to left, you are incorrect. Left to right from Vadim. Yep, it's left to right. So um, this is actually just north of uh, Three Sisters on the ridge. Um, is there a name for this ridge, Ben? It's kind of the north part of the Cortina. It's still kind of the Cortina Ridge going up there. We just refer to it as First Ridge from, from Three Sisters north. It's still just kind of First Ridge for everyone local. Right. But I think it's still technically part of the Cortina Ridge line. Um, so... Uh, how do we know the winds are left to right? So one, uh, I've been flying all day and I knew the winds are left to right. Two, you can watch the, uh, the shadows slowly move across. Um, there's nothing, oh, well, there kind of is on the right side of the clouds. If you look at the cloud in the right middle, there, you know, out in the edge of the valley, there is some leaning over to it from left to right. Um, but it's little, to be honest, it's pretty hard to tell which way the wind is except I know that the winds in general blow westy out of, um, out of Williams on your average soaring day, underlying average soaring day. Not, it's not always that way. So the, the goal was to fly up this cloud street as efficient as possible on this day. This day was in June of this year. Um, and again, you gotta be looking out of the clouds all the time. You can't just stare at them because you're gonna rear in the cloud. You're not gonna see anything. You need to keep your scan going from left, right, center, up and down, and then back into your instruments to make sure that what you think is going on outside is what's really going on. And this, when I ran this cloud, I slid over to the two. Hi, everybody. Hey. How you doing, Greg? Hi, buddy. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. Um, you. Someone's over to this right. What? All right. I slid over to the the white the white cloud that has a little flatter bottom, a little darker bottom. Then I slid back to the left, looking for the spots down the darker side that had the changing fabric and the changing color. And it's super super subtle. But you, if you're looking the right place, looking off and back, you can see the little slight changes in the fabric of the cloud. I tend to slide and work on the windward sunny side. If that's not working, I tend to slide my back, my way back a, a wingspan or two. The other key to my happiness to seeing all that stuff happen 
is my Maui gyms with polarization and root beer tint. Um, that was Rick Walter's thing, and I never believed it for seasons, and I tried it, and now I won't fly without them. Um, and yes, they're polarized. Let's see here. So that's my tips for that one. I got all the way to the end, which you can't see, um, just to beam um, the yellow area and turned around. Um, it was an amazing day. This is a really long day, actually, too. All right. This is actually a super cool picture. So um, above the instrument panel to the left is Mount uh, St. John, St. John Mountain. And this is Stonyford, right, Ben? The reservoir? Yeah, East Park or Stony Ford. Yep. Yeah. Which name? Is it East Park or is it Stony? It, it's, it's called East Park, but the town of Stony Ford's there. So if you're looking oh, okay. at a turn point database, you're going to see Stony Ford, but it is East Park Reservoir. Okay. So once again, which way is the wind blowing? Right to left or left to right or top to bottom? Anyone? Yeah. Anyone? Right. Anyone? Left to right. Yeah. And so how do we know that? We know that it, like there's three things I see that tells us. First, there's a lenny over the top. And um, you go, okay. Second, I see all the cloud tiltage um, kind of over the reservoir. Um, those are the two key things. Um, and then third, which is hard to see with the massive clouds to the right, but you can see that they're all kind of slanted over to the right. Um, so there's a lot of slanty going on. Um, this is a kind of a classic convergence day um, where it's not working great, but it's working. Um, and you can just bump along on the little edge of these wispy thingies, these cotton candy thingies, and go usually quite a distance going straight without turning once you get connected to it. But there's a couple of super important things that probably um, hasn't quite come to people's mind yet. I can think of two, but before I ask you those two, there's also, you know, straight north or straight up the picture from um, the reservoir. You can see the cloud shadows. And you could also see those cloud shadows ro rolling over the hill moving to the, to the right. So there's one super important thing going on here that the, the reservoir is telling you. Wind shadows. Yeah, um, you see ripple across the pond. Yeah, but notice what happens to the ripple. It stops. Mm -hmm. So it's ripply to the left of the air, you know, from the arrow left, and it's completely smooth to the right. That means that's your lift line right between the two somewhere. So this convergence line actually goes out there and you can kind of see it with the shadows. It goes out to that little clear ripply bit and then it bends right. Um, I've only, I didn't ever seen this in Williams until I found this picture last night. And I've seen it in New Zealand a lot where you'll get the, the converging air masses, just two air masses converging, fighting with each other. And you can go right up, might be a wingspan left or two or wingspan right or two. And you'll find that's where the sweetest spot of the convergence line is. You have to decide if you want to use that if you're trying to go straight but it is a telltale, sail, telltale sign where the two air matches are converging. That got everybody hit to blow off. All so right. just need more water to fly better convergence lines. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, boys and girls, which way is the wind? Left to right. Yeah. Um, this is again north of um, Three Sisters somewhere, um, is this year sometime. But there's a, there's a couple really key things to making things good. If you notice, and it's hard to do since I don't have a pointer, so I had to do this. There's all these little wispy bits underneath. Some of these wispy bits are good, make you super duper happy, and some are nothing. They're dead to you. Um, the key is you got to chase the fresh the freshies G used to call them. You got to chase the freshies, uh, the ones that are still moving and growing. And sometimes they'll be around for a long time and die and decay like the one in the far right arrow. That thing's probably been hanging out there and it's dead and useless. 
Then one arrow to the left, you see the little gray bits. Question is, it, is it dead or is it growing? The only way you can tell is by looking out the sky a lot. Um, and then the next arrow to that is like, is that dead or growing? I don't know. But all these things are the kind of wispy things I've been talking about. And you can use those and sometimes they work great, sometimes they don't. But if you keep connected within the top third of the convergence, the lift zone for the day, you'll be super duper happy. You won't be down here in the weeds like Carl was. That's how you achieve your wispy bit happiness. Pete. Yes. Is there an altitude below the clouds that you're talking about for the top convergence line? You know, like 1,000 feet below, 2,000 feet below. I know it's dynamic, but in general. It depends. It's, um, it's probably within a couple thousand feet if you had a 6,000 foot day. Mm -hmm. It's about 20% of the total altitude about, about underlying about. Um, and you kind of, the thing is, you kind of got to get a feel for that for the day of what is your, I try to get a feel to say, I really don't want to get below this altitude if I can prevent it. Um, and sometimes it matters a lot because if you make that mistake, you're stuck or in a field. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, it's a dynamic thing. It doesn't stay that way all day. It could get better as your day gets better. It could get higher and the answer is different. As the day is dying, you might want to stay closer to the clouds because the day is dying and the weaker, the lift is not going all the way to the ground. Um, it just depends on the situation, um, which makes part of the joy of soaring and part of the annoyance of soaring. Any other questions? Nope. Right. Ah, um, this is Bear Valley at the bottom of the photo. Um, kind of straight through the photo, you know, the center is about where Williams is, give or take. Um, this is a super important thing about flying out of Williams. Um, again, off the left wing tip and moving along the little, the little crazy bits is, you know, convergency stuff. But the question is, where is the wind coming from? And why is the wind doing what it's doing? And the key here is this what happens every afternoon in the summer because the wind's coming out of Clear Lake. And what it does, it slowly but surely pushes the lift line, the convergence line out into the valley. And this is what washes Walker Ridge out usually after three, four o'clock on the average soaring day. Now, the good news is if you're out here following the wispy bits and this Q line that's now on the other side of Cortina Ridge, um, the ridge it's right on the edge of the valley. This whole thing worked really well. And we went around it to the east and followed it into the Cape Valley. Um, it, this is kind of a super important thing about flying the soaring you have, not the soaring you want. You go, I always go to Walker. And if you go to Walker right now, you're going to always come home um, or not find a lift until you get all the way back into the valley. So clouds good, blue bad. Why does your wing look all kinky in this picture? Oh, it's an Arcus. It's that old Arcus thing. Uh-oh. Yeah, this is a few years back. All right, um, this is Stony, Stony to their left again. Um, this is actually kind of a, a classic convergency thing going on. Um, there's a handful of things that really matter. First off, which way is the wind? Anybody, 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 anybody? Oh, right Jeff, you're too smart. Yeah, it is right to left. Right to left. It's kind of coming down all the hills. Um, now the question is, these, these little wispy bits, are they fresh, are they dead? Uh, they were smoking pretty good, but you'll see that all these little wispy things you see turning and churning, and that's good because that means thermals are pushing it up. Um, it's kind of hard to see the shadows, and that is because you got this high cloud cover coming in, and usually when you see that here at Williams or in the west, it usually means there's a front coming, which is fine because that's what's driving the wind, that's good, which is driving the convergence and maybe there's wave over the top. But you gotta keep an eye on that because as the day's going on, the thermals are gonna probably get weaker and weaker because there's less sun. So you need to keep a really good eye on what's going on with the, the wrinkles I mentioned before. Is there bad news coming in the sense of high clouds, front, uh, thunderstorm blow off? The other thing is, is that you wanna be really careful hugging the the convergence with your left wing tip in this case, because there could be somebody else out there doing the same thing. So if you're getting around these little corners in the convergence, you probably want to slide up wind a little bit 
um, give yourself a little bit of room. It's not going to really affect things. There's plenty of lift. You're plenty high. So be a little more safe. Heat. Ben. This would be a huge lift band day too, right? Where on a day like today where it's getting cold, if you're up on the cloud, you're running like stink and you're trying to not get sucked into the cloud. But if you're, you could be 500 feet below that guy. And because it's all cold and shut off down low, you don't have that convective lift, right? Yep. It could, you could totally be that where the, where this kind of deal, you know, as the day's getting older and there's less and less heat, you know, if you get disconnected from the cloud suck um, and the convergence action, it can be really, unhappy you can be instead of doing 80 knots you can be down there groveling for a thermal thinking about landing in montgomery so yeah totally true in the mud in the mud with the horses ah this is the mendos this is just north of um of uh alder springs is off to the right side straight ahead um a couple of hills is black butte but this is kind of a classic average so-so so-so convergence day. We see to our left kind of clearness. We see to the right, not so much. And where those two meet, give or take a few wingspans is where the convergence line is. And look, we have a wispy right in front of us. Um, and it might not be good enough to do anything or maybe just decent air to keep moving. But if you notice, beyond the fact that the dirty clean air is showing what's going on is notice how it follows the mountains. You know, the air is, you know, the, it takes the least path of resistance. And, um, you know, the winds are from the west. Oops, sorry. Bad click. Uh, the winds are from the west. And that line went all the way up to Yolo. It's kind of snaking its way. It was not a very high day, um, but it was pretty consistent. And the key thing is consistency. If you can figure out the energy lines and they're consistent, you can keep moving maybe slower than you like, but you'll keep moving. And this day had all these little wispies or these cotton candy clouds that were coming and going all day. And the key was to chase the cotton candy, the fresh candy. And if you did, it worked out really good. If you didn't, or if you zig too far left or right, it was not fun because you didn't have much altitude between you and the ground. Um, but you'll see this quite often in the summer when it's not a great day, but you know, there's convergence working. So why is he showing you this picture? This is from last week. Question first is the wind. Which way is the wind? Anybody, anybody? Left to right. Yeah. And how can you tell that? The clouds in the distance. Yeah. Now, why would I show you this picture from November with fog? What the heck is this guy thinking? Because this is the coolest new feature to weather forecasting is all of the fire camps. Yes. So it is pretty cool. Um, if you go and it's up on the, if you go to the Williams webcams, the link is in the middle between the two webcams. And there are, you know, they put all these fire cams all over the Mendocinos and you can see all kinds of stuff, pretty much every place we fly. Why well, I put this here, we were trying to go flying about a week ago and it didn't work out too good. As you can tell, fog. But this is what happens in the summer. You get a summer inversion in the valley, which is what the fog is representing. It's basically where the inversion is. But you'll get, these, you'll get all the soaring on top of the peaks. The key for flying in Mendoza, the key for flying in mountains is to stay on top of the peaks because that's where the good lift is. If you get lift in the valley, be happy, but don't expect it. So the exception, of course, is if there's cues in the valley. Okay. Otherwise, usually all during the summer, there's some kind of an inversion. So this just remember to stay on the peaks like this is. It's the peaks stay up in the soaring where everything else is down in smooth land. And the cool thing is if you fall off the top, you have like 30 minutes to ponder your existence before you get back to Williams or if you decide to land at Willows. Um, so something to keep in mind this summer. People, uh, another comment from uh, John was a difference, uh, big difference between more and less vertical development on the last point. Little cues don't last as long. Very good point. Yeah, if they're little, um, these aren't really cues, but if they're little baby cues, they tend to cycle really quick. 
That's thanks, John. I think it was one on the one back, but yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's actually true for both. If you watch the sky, you'll see the little ones kind of come and go quickly where the bigger, more meteor ones tend to stick around longer. That's a really good point. Here we go. Getting back forward. And then, um, Another point Kempton's making, which is true, it's, it's really the high grounds, not just the peaks. And totally true. The peaks usually are a little bit better because they're sticking a little bit higher up. Also, the other thing that make peaks a little better is most of them tend to have less trees and more rocks. And if you're trying to get home someday and it's late and things, you know, you're not quite high enough to get home, go look for those bare spots, those rock spots, because they'll still be puking heat out after the sun gets low. Um, and it works pretty much every place I've flown across the planet. It's worked amazingly well. And if you don't believe me, go find a brick wall that the sun's been on all day late in the afternoon. It tends to put off heat for quite a while. Or if you just want to experience the experience. Good news um, is a whole Mendoza is going to be a rock this year because there's no trees. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how it works. Um, one of the mistakes I made a couple of years ago was this is a Albert Lee is that the morning looked like this at 10 o'clock in the morning, which is bloody amazing for Albert Lee or any place you fly. The thing is, is that by 12 o'clock is looking a little better. And Rex and I decided we're gonna wait till two o'clock because it's gonna get even better. Eh. What happened is more and more spread out started. We didn't get any rain, but there's a point where you have a very early day going, you just wanna get going around noon or so, noon 30 and just get going because a lot of times it doesn't get much better. There are, there are exceptions, Uvalde's one of them. But in general, if you see a sky like this on your average soaring site, you really want to get your butt moving because you never can tell what the rest of the day is going to do. Uh, Carl Streetick said, Pete, what were you waiting for? A thousand K day? He goes, this was Albert Lee. I said, yeah, sorry, Carl. It was pretty funny. Uh, he was just shaking his head. <laughs> All right, sometimes you need a, just 500 feet more to either A, get into the better, to a better climb, or B, to put you in a little bit better shape. Um, this is, we're final gliding back in the Mifflin Valley a couple of years ago. You notice that little glider to the right, that's an Arcus down there in the weeds. And he was a little bit impatient on this transition where I took a few extra turns to get me connected to the cloud street ahead. You know, Ben was asking, how close do you get to it? We got about five, 600 feet higher than that little glider to the right. And it made the huge difference where we got in really, really good air. And we gained on the Arcus all the way to the ridge straight ahead. Mifflin's through the gap, but we had to go up. It's Jack's Mountain. We had to go up the ridge. So sometimes just 500 feet more and get you high enough to move to the next better place or keep you connected. And then as John's pointing out, he's right. And this is where I forget anytime I fly east to the Mississippi. Uh, east Coast soaring doesn't last all day like it does out here in the West. It tends to, a street rules by five o'clock, you really want to be on final glide at the latest. So think about, keep that in mind for flying east to the Mississippi. Didn't, doesn't, uh, I mean, isn't it after five here too? Wasn't that JJ's old rule was uh, about government thermals? They all quit at five around here. Some do. They, Some do. Definitely after five. So in general, after five, the day starts to get weaker for sure. Um, but back east, it tends to be like a light switch. Mm -hmm. um, so you just, you got to keep it in mind as you're getting towards five o'clock, how the day is going. Uh, you'll see it here too. Um, this is actually one of G's favorite sayings. Uh, we are paratroopers. You say we are glider pilots. This is what we do. We're supposed to be in a situ tough situation. So sometimes you get days like this. Um, I don't remember where this was, but it was a really hard day. Um, th the point being is that if a couple of points, one, sometimes it is hard. It's just the way it is. The second point is if you're having troubles, most likely others are too. You're usually not unique in that, in that situation. Um, but you just keep, you just keep your thinking going. Where's the wind? Where's the sun? What do the shadows look like? The changing fabric of the cloud. You just keep your, I call it my story flowing and it'll be what it'll be. Um, and you just keep plugging ahead. You just keep doing your thing. Um, we didn't land out, we got home, but this is a really hard day. Just remember that as was Rick. Okay, 
just a brief time out. Uh, this is actually Ridge Soaring um, Mount, St. John's Mountain with uh, I'm on the closest glider and the other one's my friend Rick Walters. Uh, any questions uh, to recap to this point or keep going? Who took that picture? A, a friend drove up to uh, to the to damn near the top of St. John. Um, he wanted to take new pictures. I said, well, guess what? My buddy and I want to go fly. And he goes, I'll do it. It took like four and a half hours from Williams to get there. You guys fly out of Williams on that day? Yeah, this is out of Williams. Nice. Um, it was actually cool. And we just sat there for an hour ridge soaring. We didn't get very high. And then we buzzed my buddy and he got, he took a bazillion pictures. Um, I, again, I found that looking through slides for this. Do you see John's comment? Connected talk about circulation layer. Uh, wait, wait, wait. I'm reading. I'm not exactly sure what he's after. Maybe you can unmute and. Hey, John, comment. unmute I yourself. Said, you, you keep talking about connected, and I, I thought you want to. <clears throat> um, the fact that there's kind of a, a circulation layer where the cloud is sucking things up, and then there's the layer of thermals that are going up to it. And you want to be in that circulation layer, and it's uh, that's what the connected is really all about. And this idea that clouds are where the the uh, when the when the cloud forms, it releases heat, and that's why you get cloud suck and all that great stuff. If the clouds a nice thousand feet uh, thick, just the mechanism behind you, you, this connected thing, which is really important. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for clarification, John. Um, yeah, and the key is to figure out how deep that connected layer is, you know, and it changes through the day. And as the day gets weaker, that connected layer gets thinner, not, a mu not as deep, not as much altitude below the clouds. Um, it also will change depending on what you do um, if you fly into a slightly different air mass or terrain. So it's a dynamic thing, but that's what we're trying to do is stay connected and keep moving. Anything else? Uh... All right, moving on. Let's talk about wave. It's still wave season here. Um, we get waves out of out of the west and also out of the northeast. And there is a big wave day coming out of the northeast Monday, Tuesday, it looks like. Uh, Kemp believes it's epic, and he's usually right about these things. Um, so this is Omar. Um, oh, time out, please, know, sorry. Time out. Uh, there was one more. There was a question. Any any comment on telling the difference between convergence up the side of a cloud and shear wave off a cloud? So I tend to view it just as all as convergence. You have converging masses. Um, and in, on the other hand, does it really matter? Do you really care what it's called? Sure. I call it convergence because I look at it as it's two air masses pushing against each other. Um, the whole point is you want to put your glider in the lift. Um, and sometimes, you know, that might be circling, that might be figure eighting, that might be circulating, flying straight, then figure eighting. Um, so that's kind of how I look at it. Um, Does that hit that comment, Will? Uh, that's okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. See, you left and you let me go. Look what happened. So, wait, you know, you that's all it takes on a good day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need three things to make wave as everybody knows a trigger also known as a mountain we need some wind and the wind needs to stay within 45 30 degrees and a gradient and then we need the atmosphere to swoosh it all together that's the cheap easy version this is a they call it the norwest arch at omarma a long time ago and when the wave works in when it cranks in the south island it works the whole length of the island which is about the length of california not quite but close and it's amazing, it's incredible. All right, um, this is uh, in the Reno. This is looking south from Reno down towards Minden. Uh, the Sierra's on your right, the winds are right to left. The, the big point about this is I, I want you guys to watch and see how the fabric of the cloud changes, the cloud changes. You'll see rotors come and go, rotary cue come and go on the right side. And you'll see the, the Lenny grow and shrink, grow and shrink, it's about 30 seconds long. And then if there's questions, we can talk if needed. So you can see the rotors come and go off the right side. You can see the, how the Lenny fans out. You can also see some rotors going off the left side, which is the secondary wave. 
Um, as the wave gets stronger, it'll get smoother, but you can also see the ripples going across the middle of the lenny. And then as the day's getting later, less and less rotor down low, it's still there on the secondary more. You can see it doesn't mean it's not there on the primary to the right. And you can see how the whole lenny changes as sun, sunset goes. So the, the big point is all these wave systems, you know, as much as we think they're standing and nothing changes, they're very dynamic. And if you notice that the lenny was growing and shrinking, you really wanna make sure if you do have a lenny, you stay ahead of it by quite a bit because it will change. Um, you don't want to have a Lenny come out and grab you and make you into an icicle. Uh, so the question is, this is out of Minden looking north. Uh, where's the wind? Anybody? 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 Uh, all right. No, you it's the other face. way this time. Really? No, it's not. Oh. Where so, are you going the wrong way? Um, no, that's the right way. So a couple of key things. One, you got all the rotary bits again, and these will all be very dynamic throughout the day. And if you get to the freshest one will be the way you can um, thermal rotor route your way into the wave. It can be totally exciting and fun. It's kind of like being in a blender, but when you pop out of the blender, it's awesome because it's the smoothest lift you'll ever fly in. Um, so that, that's kind of, that's Washoe Lake underneath the arrows. Uh, looking farther north, you can see that the Lenny keeps going for quite a ways, but then it runs into, into some cloudiness. Um, you know, when the West Wave works here, be it Williams or anywhere in the West, um, Minden, um, it's usually because you got a front coming and you got to be really careful. You don't get yourself stuck somewhere because the front overruns you, um, which was going on here. We're trying to go up to Susanville, which would be a, a left and a right to the next gap above that mountain. And we didn't get much farther in Reno because of that. But when the wave works out of Minden, you can do lap races between Minden, Reno, and south of Minden without thinking much about it. It's pretty amazing when it works. Uh, Cape Hay. So this was uh, this last year sometime. Um, it was actually a super interesting day. First off, the wind direction, as you might expect by now, is that way. Um, but the more important thing is some subtle things below this Lenny. Take a moment to take a look to see if you can see some very subtle signs of rotor. There's more, but these are the closest ones you can see. And the thing is, it's very subtle. I took these pictures, but 30 seconds before, they had a little bit more oomph to them. And I don't remember which rotor bit I used thermaling up to get to where I'm at now on the smooth, stable wind. And how it works is you thermal up a little bit and you get blown back and you run forward a little bit, you thermal up again, you keep moving upwind, 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 and you have to go farther upwind than you want because you're blowing back downwind more than you think. And eventually you get in that smooth carpet ride. And eventually you get to see this. Um, now you also notice, wait a minute, where did all those rotors go? And this is back to dynamicness. This is taken about five minutes later. And now the wind is the wind, but there's only one rotor bit. Um, so you gotta really keep your eyes wide open looking for the changes. Um, KPA Valley uh, wave works pretty good in general in the west winds about 15 to 20 over the top. Um, but if you notice, it's not straight. It has wiggles and jiggles as you look down the Lenny. And that is because of the uh, the train upwind of you, it's not perfectly smooth. So nor, nor is the, the line of the wave perfectly smooth. Let's see here. So Bear Valley is another great wave place out of Williams. Actually, it's one of the best. Keep an eye on this little cut. You see the little cut in the mountain? This is Walker Ridge. Um, it's super important because between that and the turn point, this is bonus points now. The Bear Valley turn point is usually the hottest spot of the Bear Valley wave with the west wind. So there you go. And that cut line, um, it, it still works all the way north, but it's usually that's where the hottest spot is. Between that and the circle crop field, right? Uh, yeah, south though. Um, usually south of this to the turn point. 
south of the oh yeah but there's also a circle crop right on the ground you know that big circle is there one right underneath there yeah pretty much right where the brim road comes out there there's a big circle crop that's also in between that and the turn point are the two easiest landmarks on the ground cool i never looked down in that direction i was always looking the other side <laughs> there's only one circle crop field out there next time you're out there take a look and you'll kind of see all right. it all right so um, you might mention you have a way out to the right here back one. Oh, i mean back behind me to the right yeah yeah actually so the the bigger point here is you always want to have a way out when there's clouds around and the way out isn't necessarily circling straight down below. You want to be able to go downwind because that's a lot easier. Plus, it takes you home. And this next photo, uh, number four, is where the other photo was. So, you know, these numbers represent the three, the four wave sets I see this day. This is also last fall. So, first one is on the um, is downwind of uh, Three Sisters, and the second one is downwind of this other ridge to the left of the number. Number three is to the left of the number is a trigger, and number four is a bear valley is the bear valley wave. So it, one of the things to notice here is as you look from number one to all the way to the left side of the photo, you know the, the clouds aren't really that good. You go, there's no wave here. Well, there's not great wave, but there's really good wave there. <clears throat> there's wave that can keep you up, which is better than sitting on the couch. Um, also, if you look north. You know, from number three, look into the into the picture, you can see a very smooth, very mellow wave bounce in the clouds ahead. And that's about where the wave stopped up north. I didn't get much beyond uh, St. John's this day. Um, but I started at one. Now, you kind of have a bunch of different choices. Um, let's see here. Let's give you some location places. Hang on a second. I got two, three, and four. So those are all wave zones, which we'll talk about in a second. And these zones run, you know, in it, you know, parallel to the each of these hills, and they're fairly wide this day. Um, hey, sorry, an important topic, you may, or just something you said just a second ago about you might have to go over and not down. If you look below these clouds, I mean, if you get underneath that, you may or may not have glide home to Williams if your idea is to go down underneath and make it home though, right? Right, so oh. what you wanna do is when you're transitioning lennies, either upwind or downwind, you wanna move to the end of the lenny or the lower spot in the lenny because that way the likelihood of you going through the cloud is a lot less and also the sink or lift is a lot less. So, you know, in this case, you'd want to come, you know, come, <laughs> come to the, come, you know, either moving south or moving north and looking for the low spot in the, in the clouds to make your transition. But I, I was commenting to the, the last picture where like people's idea of, oh, I'll drop down below the cloud on moist days. That might be pretty low. You might be like 4,000 feet in Bear Valley, which is not right. something you want to glide home from going through a sinking bar in 30 seconds. Yeah, so to kind of go to that point, um, hold that thought. Yep. Uh, so Ben is totally right about this day. So let me tell you about how I attacked this flight. Um, I actually towed to number one, got off of 4,500 feet in this nice, beautiful one knot wave. It was great. It was awesome for about three, 400 feet and it stopped and it turned into 10 knots of sink. It was like, son of a, mm. so I moved around where I thought it was, moved up wind sideways, this, that. And it was not working so good. So at that point, I had a really, you had a super important question to ask yourself. A, do you run back to Williams and get a tow, which is a fine choice? Or B, do you commit to flying local to Antelope Strip? I committed to the Antelope Strip. And I also noticed where number two is, that ridge had a couple of things going on. First, that's the Cortina Ridge. Two, you can see all of these little wispy bits all in the green circles. So I was pretty sure I could, I could stick. I wasn't sure I'd ever get in the wave that day, but I was pretty sure I could stick for a while. So I went over to this number two area, worked my way up uh, to about 4,500 feet, which I was super excited because back to Ben's point, the bottom of the clouds right there were right below three. So at that point it had been really thin 
meaning a thin, not enough altitude probably to get home in a safe way. Um, so I committed to, I'm going to go to Antelope because once you do that, you can go all the way down to about 1500 feet um, near Antelope and still get a pattern and do your thing. Um, so I hung out here for a long time and heard some snarky comments about how low I was as people are towing over the top of me going all the way out here to the location four where the wave was really good. Oh, shoot. Sorry about it. Hang on. Which way did I go? My bad. Did you see while you're clicking through, uh, John also made a comment like, uh, unlike thermals, the clouds are where it happens to be moist, not where the wave is best. There can be great wave above ratty clouds. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's a super important point. So even though the clouds are ratty and not looking too good, there's plenty of soaring out here this day. So I started at one, didn't work out. I went to two, I worked thermals up to about 35 and rotor rooted in the little rotary bits that are right there next to two. Um, I was super excited. I got back up to 6,000 feet, Woo! flush. <clears throat> back down to 45 as the, the wave jiggled and wiggled, um, which is usually what happens when the wave looks like this. It's a little ratty, not so good. So then what do you do? Still committed to antelope. I came around to the little bits by uh, three, location three, and finally got into the wave after a lot of rotor rooting. Um, usually what you need to do is get about 2,000, 3,000 feet, then move to the next wave upwind, so forth and so on. Um, at the three location, that little valley, it usually works up to 8,000 feet or so, sometimes more if you're patient. I got up to eight, then I finally moved my way from three to four, but I came around here to the south to get all the way out of the clouds before I hooked my way into the, um, into four to make sure I don't fall down into the lennies. Um, there's been many stories over the years where people fall down the lennies and end up in pieces. Um, so stay out of clouds. So there, the, somebody's asking, Mike Thompson's asking about the rotors. The little rotors are these little, little wispy, turny dudes. And you can see them because they're always there. They might not stick around for long, but you could see them when I was trying to figure out what to do. You could see the very subtle changes as it came and went. Um, and they would come and go, come and go. And that would be where you try to, try to get your climbs in, into the wave. And when you get to the top of it, you'll know because you keep working up wind and then it gets super smooth as you're sitting here and Vario makes that happy, happy up music. Is this a, uh, one sec, Michael, is this more of a question on, you know, being careful to stay out of the rotor? Um, because we don't really have that kind of rotor. You know, you think about rotor from the standpoint of like men didn't throw you upside down rotor. Williams rotor is very soft, gentle rumble, not very violent normal rotor that you read about in horror movies. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's, I've only been in wave one time ever. And that was, um, I didn't realize it until I was in it. Uh, that was at Elsinore and you couldn't, it, it was blue. I mean, you couldn't see much of anything or maybe it was there and I just didn't recognize it. And for a short time, it was fairly violent. Um, and then, it, yeah, like you said, it gets super, super smooth. So it, it sounds like here, it's not a huge uh, I deal. Well, the deal is we tend to, you know, we tend to be higher than, it depends where the airport is relative to the rotor. Um, you know, it, it can be the, it can be pretty, I don't want to say violent, but it can be pretty rough. Um, you, you know, if you have a west wind of 15 knots or so with increase, increasing gradient as you go higher, most likely there's some kind of wave influence out here in the Mendoza somewhere. Um, and the kind of one of the points I'm trying to make here is that, you know, with these three numbers, one, two, three, four, all those places are downwind of a, um, a little hill, a little trigger, and they're all triggering wave. Um, I, you know, by the time you get out, you know, if you take a normal tow out to the Mendos or even to Three Sisters, you're usually 3,500 to 4,000 feet. So you're tending to be at the top of the rotor zone, but there's times where the wave doesn't, you know, start really working well to get above 10, like this was the day. And eventually, I got to location four and I got to 16 or 17 and 
went north to St. John's, but the way was not really cooperating around St. John's farther north. Um, so I don't, you know, the horror stories about rotors only if you're close to the ground or close to a tow plane. Otherwise, it's just turbulence. Um, and I've done a lot of rotor reading out of Minden. Um, it, it's a wild toad ride. It's not, you don't want to do it unless you're ready to do it. But there's nothing more satisfying, though, when you get out of the bumpies into the smooth. Yeah, the, um, the John Cochran's also making the point that um, um, uh, the rotor is, you know, the, the mechanics of the way it's turning air. And then there's usually thermals going up the face of the rotor. Um, so they're kind of in some ways two different things. And in general, you want to be upwind of the rotor because that's where the lift will be. Um, you don't want to just sit in the rotor, you know, getting all banged around because there's no lift, there's no lift or happiness involved in doing that. Any other questions? So finally in the wave, um, over Bear Valley, it's one of the most, rec this wave works pretty much any day. Um, even in the summer, there'll be a little bit of wave lift in Bear Valley. Um, you won't see it, it'll be completely blue, but the air, the air will be there. Um, if you notice this cloud, it's not, it's not super defined. Like you're thinking of the Lenny I showed you earlier. And it's the way it is sometimes. You don't want to get too stuck on having the clouds not look exactly like an amazing wave day or an amazing thermal day or whatever. You know, the lift is, the lift is. Um, just take advantage of it the best you can. Okay, we have another brief break for questions if there's any. This is one of the wave days this past fall. Um, that's the uh, 32 out of Williams. Um, and again, you look at the clouds, you go, that don't look like a wave day. We're up around 10, 12, 12,000 feet all day. Um, you know, the whole point is just go flying and flying different stuff. And by flying a different stuff, you'll be able to, you know, do these different things and don't have to work, worry for the perfect day. Uh, no questions, no questions. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Where is the uh, trigger for the Bear Valley Wave? Okay, um, I, also, I see, okay, what is where the trigger, it's uh, Walker Ridge. Uh, Walker Ridge is just west of Bear Valley and sometimes it's on the west side, sometimes it's on the east side, sometimes it's in the middle. All depends what the wind's doing and the atmosphere's doing. Um, and there's really no, there's a lot of similarities with each wave day, but there's usually no black and white, it's always here kind of moment. Um, even out of Minden, there's a lot of similarities, but it changes depending on what the atmosphere is doing. Uh, what about, speed to move upwind on the wave bar? Um, it all depends what you believe, Jeff. Um, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, there's kind of a couple ways to look at it. If you're really high, you can fly a little bit faster to get upwind quicker to get into the better wave. But you want to be careful you don't um, flop into sink, you know, fall out the wave um, or fall into a cloud. Um, then there's the whole, if you want to totally fly the perfect speed then in the perfect glide angle, you know, it's best glide plus half the wind. Um, I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing these days, but it all depends what you believe for the moment. But the key thing is you want to be super careful that you don't go bombing up wind and fall out of the wave. Um, that's why it's important to transition in a, in a low spot of the Lenny, if there is a Lenny, or if he's not a Lenny, move in a place where you think that the wave's not so good. And in the Bear Valley example, the south end of Bear Valley doesn't work so good. So the picture I was showing you, um, this picture, you know, I've slid almost all the way over I-20. And if you notice all the cues stop, it doesn't mean there's not, there's not wave down here, but see how jumbled up it is to the left of the screen um, at number four, you know, south of four. Um, so the wave is not really that good. So I slid here to get around the clouds, also to take this picture. Um, but you could also be a little closer to the end of the line and probably been fine too. I kind of over-exaggerated this one. All right, so spotty wave. 
the, the key thing to keep in mind, this is out of Omarama. Um, again, Omarama is at the end of the Selenny to the left a little bit. But the point I'm trying to drive here, there's two key things. One, notice how the, the wave itself zigs and zags. Um, and that's just because it's following the terrain. Also notice there's different layers of lenticulars going on here. And that's because there's, there's a front coming. Um, and the same thing will happen in the Mendocinos with a front coming, um, where it'll zig and zag with the, with the terrain. But also as the front gets closer with more moisture, the ceiling slowly but surely comes down. And you want to be really careful you don't get stuck in a weird place where you're sandwiched between a bunch of clouds and you don't have any escape. Um, but that would just kind of illustrate those, those two important points. Uh, New Zealand again, or over Mount Cook. Um, but again, it's just the, the point of this one, of course we know the wind is this way, we're in the Southern hemisphere. Um, but notice how the, all the clouds, besides I think it's a beautiful picture, all the clouds are zigging and zagging through, through the um, terrain. You know, it's gonna find the easiest, the easiest path. And if you notice in the bottom left corner of the photo, you can see the, the air falling over the hill and it's making the bounce, which is in the wave I'm in right here. You can also up that ridge a little ways, you can see where it's peeking, peeking through again. And this is another wave spot, kind of right underneath the wingtip and go a finger width. Um, um, so the point is, is that, you know, none of the mountains are perfectly smooth, perfectly straight. Uh, the wind is lazy like water. It's gonna find places to squirt through. And if it squirts through the right place, you can get yourself a little wave. Um, we always think about waves, the length of the Sierra or the length of the Mendoza. A lot of times there's little stepping stone waves everywhere. Don't be afraid of the wave. This, first off, which way is the wind? So we got a wind question again. You're not going to believe this one. This is out of Omarama again, a couple of years back. Anybody? Right to left. And your face. It's actually the other way. I told you you wouldn't believe it. Really? Um, it's Lake Pakatipu underneath you to the right. It's all that color because it's glacial runoff. Um, there's actually three wave sets here. Um, the, there's this long ridge line to your left, and there's this little wave down low, which you can see this little cluster in the middle of the picture. Then there's a, another one to the left, and then there's another one on top of that to the left. There's three, three waves stacked, but they're leaning upwind. I've never seen it do this there. I've never seen it do this anywhere. Um, and this little witch's hat, this little curl, I didn't have the gusto to go play with that. But Gavin Wills was ahead of me, and he did. And he said, Pete, it worked great. What was wrong with you? And I said, it looked like a breaking wave, Gavin. Uh, anyway, I rode this all the way up straight. And then coming back, I got on the, the tall one. Um, it was, this cloud was bizarro all day. Um, I've never, nobody ever seen it ever do anything like this before. Um, and then if you look to the right side of the, the photo, you can see waves, secondary waves um, downwind of this one. Um, and again, quite a bit of mess with the low clouds on top of the hills and, um, but still wave over the top. And again, looking to the left of the photo, you can also see the clouds on top of the hill and there's a nice phone gap for where the wave lift is, but there was a front coming and about an hour later it was raining. So you just got to keep your eyes wide open for these kind of wrinkles of the day as the day goes on. Uh, wind. Anybody? Anybody? Left to right. Yeah, you're right on this one. So a couple of interesting things about this. This is looking northwest out of Omarama again. Uh, first off, you can see the smoke. And notice how it's moving across the, the Q Lenny looking thing. Um, you know, none of the lift is right next to the cloud. In this case, it's out quite a bit. And it's out farther than you might think it is. But if you notice, the front of that cloud is going straight up. So there's no wind on that cloud down, you know, right in front of it. But if you go out a ways, you can see where the, the smoke starts again. So you need to keep an eye on the front of clouds when you're trying to work wave to see if there's lift up the front or is it out more out farther out. I always try close to the cloud first. 
but if not, you might have to go farther upwind than you think. Um, the smoke you see is from that little island west of uh, New Zealand called Australia, and it was from the bushfires when I was there. It was a terrible season. It was all smoky and shitty, and we had three weeks of this. It just was no fun. Sounds like California this year. Yeah, this is a while back, but um, the cool thing is we had a bunch of pictures like this. You go, wow, look at the flow. But unfortunately, it, you know, th this was not cloud above you. It was all smoke coming from Australia. It wasn't good. All right, tips time. Not the haven't gotten tips, but here's finish up some tips. Um, sometimes you have a day like this. This is Hobbs. And you're going, what the heck should I do with this? I was flying a G a few years back, and um, I didn't know what to do. I go, G, what do we do? Quiet. He goes, I have no idea. And I'm looking, I'm going, why am I paying you for this if you have no idea? And he goes, well, sometimes you don't. So what do we do? Fly straight. And about 60 seconds later, we had an idea what to do. In this case, this photo is really clear what to do. We had to hopefully get to that cloud that's out on the edge of the sun um, before the rain put us on the ground. And there was a place to land up ahead. And we got down to, I don't know, some altitude that was not much fun. And we got back up. And as we got deeper into the photo, we got out of the rain and, you know, soaring started again. So keep it in the air, shift your gears, shift your thinking and keep moving. Don't give up, but make sure you have a place to land. There we go. Sometimes things just don't work out. Um, this is in Tennessee during the Pan Americans. Um, it was really sad because I was two miles short of home and the rain shower was right there. I had to come back 10 miles to land here with these other eight people, which you can see in the right in the right side of the photo. There's eight other gliders in this field. Um, it was a grass field, so of course it was muddy. But you always need to make sure no matter what you're doing, you have a place to land that you are comfortable with landing, not you're happy to squint your way to landing that I know I can land safely there. And if not, you needed to land safely or sooner somewhere else. Um, don't put yourself in a weird place. Um, somebody did that in this day and they broke their glider in half for you know no good reason. Um, so don't do that. Um, this is Hobbs. And if anybody can count, actually, you can probably see this for once. Um, this is a gaggle. It had about a dozen or more gliders in it. Um, um, super important to make sure you don't wear yourself out. You can hear the glider talk to you or you can feel the glider talk to you and to minimize your drag. You want to make sure all your control movements are smooth as possible to flow like water. If not, you're not going to be able to feel what the glider is telling you as it's going through the air. You're going to wear yourself out and you can make drag and that way we'll outclimb you and laugh at you. So keep that in mind. Everything should flow like water. If it's not, then you need to work on your technique. I thought mine was really good. Then I flew a Spreckley. This was better. Um, the other thing is you want to try really hard to uh, spend no more than 10 seconds in the cockpit. Um, as you can see, this is a, in the back seat, there's this beautiful clear nav computer and all these other good things, but um, all the real, it's not going to tell you where the lift is. It's not going to tell you what you need to do in the next minute, two, five, or 10. It's just going to tell you where it is right now. So keep your eyes, eyes outside of the cockpit. This is out of Mifflin. Um, the mountain or ridge soaring on doing warp speed is jacks. And um, even though there's, you look at the sky, you go, wait a minute. There's no lift. Well, there's no thermals, but the ridge is smoking. Um, and it, actually, there's still is thermals on the bare spots. There's these occasionally rocky bare spots, and there's still weak thermals on the bare spots. So keep your eyes out of the cockpit so you can see the sky and also so you can see what other people are doing and so you don't run into somebody. Um, the other thing is, again, we have this beautiful sky. This is out of Uvalde. You go, oh, I'm going to go soaring. One of the first things when I flew with uh, G, we're coming into a cloud like this. He goes, what are you going to do? I go, I'm going to go fly in the cloud. And he goes, that's not a plan. You need a plan because until you have a plan, you can't change it. So, you know, we talked about how you attack a cloud and what was your path to the cloud, trying to find the lift. And if you didn't find lift, where you're going next. Or as uh, Dick Butler, one of the top U.S. pilots here in the country, says hope is not a strategy. And it's totally true. You got to have a plan and the plan needs to keep rolling throughout the day. Usually when I get in trouble is when my plan stops. 
And um, when my plan stops, it tends to go <laughs> into very grumpy times. Uh, let's see here. Um, the other thing is staying, this is a Dick Butler's Concordia, one of a kind open class glider. This is out of Cordelia, Georgia. Um, he went by me like I was going backwards, um, but he should. Um, the key thing is keeping that plan flowing through the whole flight. You know, how high am I? What kind of lift I'm willing to take? Um, what's my next plan for the next, you know, five, six, eight clouds? Think about clouds kind of like pool shots. You're trying to connect your pool shots together. And if you keep that going, then when things don't work, it'll be a lot less of a shock. Like, holy moly, what do I do? So, well, this is the all of you nice plane. Um, that little glide up there is Gavin and we're running around um, doing crazy things. Uh, this is New Zealand again. Um, you know, I just took my first flights in the new year yesterday and I tend to give myself a baby flight review where I do all those things to remind me how the glider flies you know, turns, airspeed, I got flaps, got to play with those. I simulate thermaline, steep turns, change the bank, keeping the speed constant. Um, I also simulate a landing where I put the glider in landing config, speed, flaps, spoilers, gear, and I practice the rollout, the, the rollout a couple of times as if you're landing to get a feel for what that feels like. Um, again, we don't have, we have wave season right now, but if you don't hit the wave, it could be a few days or a few weeks between things. So since I hadn't flown in seven weeks, um, I went out and did that. I'll do it again in three weeks if there's not soaring to keep keep me proficient and current. Um, you want to be ready so we get these great soaring days coming up. It's not like your first flight of the year. Um, fly in all conditions. Just don't wait for the great days. Uh, you'll miss a lot of fun if you do that. Um, one of the things we did at the U.S. team camp that Spreckley talked about was we'd figure a course that we could fly three times around in, in the soaring day. And the idea is you fly it three times around to get a sense of how the weather changes and how your tactics change. You start, you, we'd start a little bit when it's a little weak and then we'd do a course and the next lap would be medium to strong and the last one would be strong into dying day. And, you know, trying to do something like Goat Mountain St. John, sheet iron, a short one, or pushing that all the way out to goat, sheet iron, to black, black butte and back. Try doing that three times and watch how the day changes. Um, you'll learn quite a bit about your skills and also about the weather on the Mendoz. Um, take a look at the IGC flights from uh, the smart guys out of Williams. There's plenty to choose from um, up on OLC. So you can go, hey, here's what these people are doing. And a lot of times, you'll see on Williams Live where people are talking about their flights and they'll post them. Um, the other thing that's important, this is a uh, Scott Valley uh, to Montague. You know, if you're not having fun on a day like this, you're probably doing something wrong. So if you're not having fun, you probably need to go find somebody to help you have fun because it should be fun, even the rough days. One of the things that Dick Butler told me a long time ago and it was one of those really rough days. He goes, Pete, you can remember this story until you quit flying. And he's right. I, you tend to talk about the hard days, not really the easy days. Okay, so now you're just going, wow, this is awesome. I want more knowledge. Well, here it is. For the people who don't know about Williams Live, or Williams Day, excuse me. Um, you know, go, it's free, go sign up. And this is where you'll see all of us talking about what's coming. And here's Kempton talking about the Wave Watch coming up for Monday. Um, you can go to the Williams Soaring uh, webpage in the top left corner. Here's that little button you'll see and get yourself in there and get signed up and just watch the world go by. Um, and it's a great place to share knowledge. You'll hear us also talk, mainly talk about weather and our great flights we have. Um, another place, uh, Wings and Wheels has this uh, newsletter and you have all these great people talking about it. Um, I'm a real fan of Garrett's stuff and um, Adam Woolley. They're all good, but those two guys talk about the stuff I'm most interested in. You can also go back to their blog and all the um, columns they've ever written um, are posted on the blog. And a new column comes out every two to three weeks. Um, it has a little bit of advertisement on the side, but they won't sell your email or anything. Um, and I think you'll find them very useful. Um, at least I do. 
So now you need a book or two or three. Since most of us can't fly with G, um, he's written a, a three volume series. Um, they're all three are available from Wings and Wheels. And these are all from his lectures that he was giving in New Zealand. The cool thing about them is that they're pretty quick read. They're right to the point. There's not a bunch of jibber jabber. Um, he has a page of words followed with a page of diagrams to kind of explain what he's saying. And a lot of the stuff I've been talking about here today has come from my flying with G. So volume one has those topics. Volume two has those topics, convergence and wave. Volume three it just came out um, last August. And it talks about high performance storming, which means basically flying more efficiently. He takes all the topics from above and kind of talks about how do you do that more efficiently. And I bid you the end of the day, thanks for everything, Sunset and Hobbs. Any last questions? Two, uh, two other things. One was uh, from my mom. She said, uh, you can also watch Flarm live tracking. So if you can't make it to a soaring day, you can see what people are doing live on the Flarm tracker. And uh, another training tips. And I think this is going to come up in later talks, but uh, John Cochran said, best training, uh, fly a contest, right? Truckee Regional is a good, low pressure, friendly, good tasks um, contest. Also, is Montague doing a regionals? Yeah, they probably are. They, they did. They had one scheduled last year. And the thing about flying regionals and um, the way to look at it, there's two really important points about that. One, you're going to go fly for a week um, and you'll fly in a bunch of different weather and you'll get a week of flying, which, you know, how often do you fly for a week? Uh, it's one of the things that made my flying a lot better. Two, you got a lot of friends around to talk about your flying. So you go, hey, you did this, that. And three, you can fly at whatever level of of fun you want to fly you know um you, you just as it fly the same way you'd fly flying out of williams but you have a start gate and finish gate um and also when you fly your first contest or two they'll give you a buddy um and most of us would be happy to be your buddy if you come prepared to fly um so it's the best way to learn how to fly how to improve your flying um i think montague is probably going to have one this year same time the nationals and then the truck you one john mentioned as well as the, the camps, I don't know, is Air Sailing doing their thermal camp and cross-country yeah. camp? But those are also very, very good training uh, training weeks yeah. or weekends. Yeah, Air Sailing has three camps. They have a thermal camp, a cross-country camp, and then a contest. And if you've never flown in the mountains out in Nevada, you really want to fly and go fly the thermal camp first to kind of to get your skills together. It takes a while to get used to it. Um, but again, you go fly for a week, you get totally immersed in it for a week, and I guarantee you your flying will be better. Um, and you most likely get some new friends. Um, what else is here? Bunch of thank yous. Oh, cool. Um, you're all welcome, you guys. I'm really happy you enjoyed it. Um, there's another question. Oh, the scan. Scan. So Philip's asking, do you have any method, the way to scan? Um, I kind of scan looking at it for the weather. I kind of scan in the sense of time. Like, what do I think is going to happen in the next minute, the next five minutes, the next 10 minutes, the next 30? And sometimes you can't see it. Um, I have been surprised many a time ago. I see that and you quit paying attention to it. And it's kind of one of those things you need to, depending on what's going on, update yourself every five, 10, 15 minutes um, and to just watch how the day is changing. But usually if you have what I call my story rolling, it's just part of my story. Like I just, I'll talk to myself, you know, what do I see? I see X, Y, Z. And you don't want to have a big, huge, long discussion with yourself as much as I see high clouds coming in from the West. My concern is they're going to keep coming and slow down or cut off the soaring. And then the next time you kind of look that way, are as the high clouds change? No, are they getting worse, getting better? And just trying to keep that story flowing um, that rhythm going. Um, and if you do, it tends to work out. Okay. When I don't, this is back to, uh, things don't work out. Okay. Um, uh, more thank yous. Appreciate the thank yous, you guys. We're happy to, um, happy to help the best we can to share our knowledge and fun. Hopefully this format, it's not my favorite format, but I've, we figured it's better to do this than not. 
Um, I missed my uh, laser pointer. If I could try to have a laser pointer of some kind, it'd be really helpful, um, which I have no idea how to do. If somebody does out there in Zoom land, it'd be great. Um, <laughs> Captain. <laughs> um, anything else from anybody? Do you have any final thoughts for the Benjamin, Mr. Vice President? No, I think, uh, you know, thank everyone for. Oh, go ahead, Jim. No, I'm sorry, I was muted. But anyway, Pete, thank you. That was super presentation. Thank you, Jim. I'm glad you liked it. I hope you can remember these things this year and you can say, wow, I remember this and that happened the right way. Or if it doesn't, let me know. It doesn't always happen the right way. I, your, your tips I keep in the forefront flying. It has, it has gotten me home many times. Cool. So Pete, I have one last couple of, couple of questions, if you could. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if you don't mind, would you just say a few things about flying a northeast wave at Williams like we're going to see Monday. Ups and be down. Very careful. Um, so the deal with the northeast wave at um, Williams. So the first concern is the uh, winds on the ground. They'll usually blow like stink at some point in the day. Not always, but usually they'll blow up over 30. So you got to be ready to do that. The good news is it tends to blow straight down the runway. Um, the tricky bit about it is with the northeast wind, it means the wave is on the west side of um, uh, Goat and the whole mountain range in Mendoza. So with the winds that are blowing 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, as you get higher knots, trying to get back up wind to the west, I mean, excuse me, to the east is difficult. So the whole opportunity of places you get to land if things don't work right is a, is a lot different. Um, the other thing is you think, of, oh, I can go land at, at uh, Lamson. You can. But the problem with Lamson is probably has a lacious crosswind because remember, all of the airports are aligned for the normal winds, the average winds. So most likely any place you land, not every place, you have, have crosswind concerns. The other thing is in the valley, in the Napa Valley where I'm at right now, um, you know, Calistoga Airport's gone. It would be a rough field landing, but your off-field landing choices, you got to be very careful. So as you get down around 10, that you're probably running already to a place to land. Doesn't mean you're going to land, but you're probably running west more to get out to Healdsburg or Ukiah, maybe Santa Rosa, um, to make sure you have glide, glide capabilities. Um, and that's kind of it. The other thing is if you go down to Napa Valley down here where, where the wave does rock, I've flown the Napa Valley wave quite a bit. Um, you got to get back up wind, um, which sometimes can be very challenging with the 70, 80 knot headwind, if that's what the winds do at 18,000 feet. Um, but on the other hand, if it works like it looks like it's going to, it's an amazing magic carpet ride. Um, but it's definitely not something you do on your early wave flights, unless you just stay right at GOAT. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's definitely a tricky bit. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I haven't looked at the weather close enough to decide what to do, but as Kempton saying, you know, these, these days come around every five to eight years. You know, we don't get these every year where everything sinks up the way it does, or it couldn't sink up and it doesn't work at all. Um, we'll see. Um, it just, you know, big wave days have big wind and you got to be ready to fly big wind. And it might be so big wind that we don't even fly. You know, I mean, it's 30, 35 plus gusting. We might not even be able to get the hangar doors open to get a tow plane out if it's that bad. Plane's away. What was that? Right. Yeah. Um, no, I was going to say, um, over 30, you need extra help to move your glider, let alone the tow plane. And, you know, over 30, it's right on the edge. And I've flown in 30s and 30s and to 40s. And it takes a lot more discipline. And the risk reward gets kind of spooky. Um, so we'll have to see. Now, on the other hand, you, you'll get days here where the ground winds aren't so bad. And you'll get your a narrow window to take off. But usually in the afternoon, 
late morning, afternoon till you get to four or five in the afternoon, um, it can be extremely windy on the ground. Um, and if you're landing off field or landing somewhere else, there's probably not a lot of people around on a windy day to help you deal with your glider in that kind of wind. And at 30 plus knots without you and the glider, it will blow away if you're not careful or at least blow into things. Um, so, you know, be careful. Uh, but it could be an amazing, glorious day too, 5,000 kilometers, which would be kind of neat. Um, there's something else in here. I think they were talking about how you could use a laser pointer, getting oh. tech support. Yeah. Um, we'll have to play with that. Yeah, we, we played with this a little bit. We're gonna have to play with this some more. So thanks for all the tips on laser pointers. Um, we tried it on Thursday or Friday, it didn't work and we kind of got stuck doing other things. Yeah, any other, um, anything else for us? You said you had two questions, I thought. No, just, just a few. You know, those were the, you did exactly what I wanted, you know, what I wanted to hear. All right. Um, and, and I'm not saying you shouldn't fly, it's just understand the risks and figure out how to mitigate the risks. Um, in my mind, take off a landing is the spookiest part um, and getting flushed out of the wave where you don't have a place, a good place to go. Um, being one that's been flushed out of waves all across this planet. So you just got to know the game you're playing. Anything else, anybody, anybody? Thank you, Pete. You're welcome, Ben. Thanks, Pete. So, yeah. so again, I'd like to thank Pete. The big, um, for everyone still here, the next one will be the 30th, I believe. I'll talk about how to fly far by flying close to the airport. And you kind of talking on more of like the training tips Pete was talking about and what to do. Um, and then following that, I have a couple other speakers lined up. I'll be able to I'll announce them soon, but, uh, Dennis Linekin is talking for us in March and Alex Nair. Uh, if anyone's looking to would like to speak or knows of anything they'd like to hear about, um, in particular, please, uh, shoot us an email and I'll see if I can't line out a speaker to cover any, uh, any various topics you guys might want to hear. We can, you know, this is, we can do as many of these as we'd like to. So uh, thanks everyone for joining in. It was a great time. Uh, and once again, thank you, Pete, for another great Mr. Alexander conversation. Thanks, Ben.